Uh, please also keep yourself muted at all times so that there isn't any background noise during the presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions you'd like to ask throughout the presentation, please enter them into the chat box. We will wait to answer any questions until after the presentation. I also have noted some of the questions that were submitted with the registration. So thank you to those of you who uh, passed in your questions as well. It's your choice whether or not you choose to share a video of yourself during tonight's presentation. And lastly, if you happen to be experiencing any technical issues, please send a personal chat to Becky or myself, and we will do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. With that said, uh, we're really excited to introduce Jan Collins. Uh, Jan is a 26 year high, uh, veteran high school teacher, science teacher, a former interpretive specialist for the Appalachian, <clears throat> excuse me, Mountain Club, a two time Appalachian Trail through hiker, co author of 40 Nature Walks in Southern Maine, and a 2016 graduate of the Maine Master Naturalist Program. Her presentation on Maine bats on the path to extinction was her capstone project for the Maine Master Naturalist Program. She's a native of Maine and lives with her husband, Irving Fonts, in their blueberry farm in Wilton. I really hope that everybody enjoys tonight's presentation. Uh, with that said, I'm going to hand things off to you, Jen. Oop, Jan, I think you're muted. That helps, right? Um, Thank you so much for having me and also thank you to everyone for attending today's presentation. I am not going to focus on tiny details of bat biology. I am going, to, it is my hope that I will give you some background to understand and care about bats and whether or not they survive. And to do that, I'm going to start with giving you some background on extinction in Maine and what Maine was like prior to Westerners arriving on our shores. This quote is from Mark McCullough, who wrote Maine's Endangered and Threatened Wildlife. And what it describes is Maine at the time that Europeans arrived. It was in Eden. There were clear rivers. You could drink the water anywhere. There was it was totally forested. We had caribou herds. Lobster was so plentiful that you could pick them up by the bucketful on the beach after a storm. In the 200 years after first European contact, things have changed. And as it didn't take long for them to start changing. One of the first animals to go extinct was the Atlantic gray whale and it became extinct due to overhunting in 1740. This picture, sorry, I'm gonna make this bigger. This picture of course is not a photograph because you couldn't do that in 1740. It is an artist's rendition of what an Atlantic gray whale would have looked like. I'm not sure what's happening, but I can't. oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, the great auk is another example of an animal that has become extinct, and they were present in the millions prior to 1844 when the last nesting pair was taken to meet the needs of a European museum. The Labrador duck not one that most people have heard of. It looks a lot like our eider. Um, also became extinct in the 1800s, again, from overhunting. The sea mink. Our Eastern version of that wonderful sea mink on the West shores that we adore, who lay on their backs and eat, take rocks and open shells and eat them. We had sea minks here by the thousands. And again, from overhunting, they became extinct around the turn of the century. This was prior to, any, to Maine having any laws limiting hunting. 
and everyone has heard of the passenger pigeon. This is the fecundity of the passenger pigeon prior to extinction. On your right hand side, you can see a pile of passenger pigeons with someone standing on the very top. We thought that there would never be an end to them because when they flew over, they went on for miles and miles and miles. And yet there was an end and the passenger pigeon is no more. So we do have something to lose. We have lost several different species already in the history of Maine. The consequences are different now. Sometimes we lose extin extinction due to purposeful hunting, but now it seems we are losing species not because of purposeful hunting, but because of disease that we've imported or because of habitat destruction or loss. These three bats were listed in, I think it was 2016, in Maine. All three of them are called myotis bats and they were the, are the smallest bats that we have in Maine. The eastern small-footed myotis is listed as endangered. This bat specialized in alpine areas and often um, found itself roosting under rocks and in crevices. The northern long-eared myotis has always been found in isolated spots around the state. Its name comes, of course, from very obvious long ears that it has. And um, again, it's threatened. Its habitat was forest, where it would actually um, roost under the bark of dying or dead trees or in small um, cracks in trees. And then the little brown bat or the little brown myotis which is or was the most prolific bat in Maine. It doesn't matter where you lived. 10, 11 years ago, any evening that you went outside, these little bats would be flying around, whether you lived on a pond, in a field, um, in the forest, they were everywhere. They were ubiquitous and hard to imagine that they could ever disappear. So there are um, three different ways that we try to keep track of how many bats that we have. One of them is by studying or surveying hibernacula. So hibernacular is just another word for checking out where bats hibernate during the winter. I'm going to show you a graph in a few slides of what the highest numbers were for bat counts in hibernacular and what the lowest numbers are. But in 2013, in a hibernacular survey in the state of Maine, there were no little brown bats found in those hibernacular. Now we know that the three hibernacular that we've identified in the state of Maine are not the only hibernacular. They're just the only ones that we can find. But in those, there were none at that time. Same year, there was only one long-eared bat found in the three hibernacular that we've identified in the state of Maine. And then the, another way that we can survey bats is by counting the number of bats that roost or have their summer um, birthing sites in Maine homes. In 2006, in Upper New York State, 
some spelunkers, people who go into caves and investigate them or just go for recreational purposes, found a very disturbing sight. There were hundreds of bats lying on the floor of the cave, either dead or dying. And the odd thing about these bats is that they had a white fungus on their nose or on other membranes on their body. So this was disturbing, but we didn't know whether or not it was just in one cave or it was in lots of caves. And it took time for us to figure out what exactly was going on and whether or not this was something that we should be concerned about. By 2010, we had discovered that this fungus, whatever it was that was killing the bats, was on our doorstep in Maine. It had moved across New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, into Canada, and then westward as well. As a result, the Maine, Maine Audubon Society decided that the best way that they could um, figure out whether or not this white nose was gonna have an impact on Maine was to do surveys of homes where little brown bats had traditionally lived in the summertime as they brought up their young. So they found 50 different homes, people who volunteered, um, that had had little brown bats staying in their homes in the summer for years on end. They signed up those people as volunteers and they started a project so that they could count the number of bats that they had before White Nose came to Maine. This is important because unlike other animals, it's very difficult to do good population studies on bats. If there's anybody in this audience that has birding background and has done bird surveys, you know that you go out early so that you can um, take, hear them singing. You bring your binoculars so you can see them. They're usually, many of them are colorful, so they stand out in the trees. Now think about animals that only come out in the dark. When humans aren't very good at seeing in the dark and they make absolutely no sound, so there's nothing to listen to. So because of lack of technology, we really didn't know how many bats there were. And even today, we don't really have a good idea of how many bats there are and where they are. So there are only a couple of ways that we could actually study that. One is, I've already mentioned, that's the hibernacula, going to places that we know bats hibernate in and counting them while they're hibernating. Two are their summer roosts. So um, I'm going to give a sh shout out to Judy Upham, who's in the audience, because I've spent several evenings at her house counting the bats as they left the gable end of her house through a little vent. Um, so we haven't actually gone up in her attic and counted them to see how many adults and babies there are, but we are counting the ones that are flying out in the evening at dusk. In this case, Maine Audubon had lined up these 50 houses. They were going in in the summer of 2011. They were going to count them. When they, what they discovered in 2011 is that only 10 of those homes had bats. And of the 10 homes that had bats, only one had any reproduction. And we don't even know if those survived. That was the last year that there were little brown bats nesting in those homes. We were one year too late.
The third way that we can survey bats is through bioacoustic surveys. And this is particularly done around wind turbines before they're permitted. They actually do put up surveys so they can hear bat calls and then they count them. So prior to white nose syndrome, fully a little more than half of all the signals that were de detected at these sites where we were putting up wind turbines were one of those three myotis bats. We can't be more specific than that because the myotis bat calls are very similar and the technology wasn't sophisticated enough to be able to tell one myotis bat from another. So of the seven bats that are found in Maine, almost more than half of them were these little brown bat cousins called the myotis bats. Since white nose, 1% or less of all the calls recorded at these bioacoustic surveys are myotis bats. That is a 98% decline in the myotis bat population. Remembering that myotis bats were our most prolific and ubiquitous bat in Maine. So hibernaculum surveys, bioacoustic surveys, surveys of maternity colonies, all indicate devastating and catastrophic population declines for these three bats. So the primary threat, at least to the myotis bats, is pseudogymno Ascus destructans. Notice the destructans at the end. This is responsible for the death by 2014 of five and a half to six and a half million bats. We know now that that is way over 10 million bats that have been killed by this fungus. Where did the fungus come from? We're not exactly sure, but we think it was brought here from Europe. It is a native of Europe. Bats there evolved with the fungus, so they do not generally die from exposure from it. They become almost immune to it. If a bat is weak or ill, it may succumb, but generally they're able to fight it off. What does a fungus do? Well, if there's anybody in this group who's ever had athlete's foot, you have an idea of what a fungus does to the bat. So a fungus has this really unique ability to send out little shoots, like root-like fingers called hyphae, and those actually break into the cell, use the digestive enzyme to digest the cell, and then absorb it back into the fungus. So what happens if you have athlete's foot is you start to see, you start to get this itchy feeling. Your skin cracks and peels. A lot of dead skin comes off. So what the fungus is actually doing is it's consuming you while you alive. The same thing is true for thrush, which is an, another thing that babies often get, adults rarely get unless you have something like asthma and you're taking um, a cortisone base uh, inhaler. And again, it's a fungus, it's in your throat, likes moist, wet places, just like the athlete's foot fungus does. And it starts digesting you from the um, from your mouth. So it, this fungus is doing the same thing to bats. It's digesting the bat and the entryway is generally the mucous membranes of the bat, the nose and mouth. But the fungus will um, continue to eat the bat after it's dead. Um, 
And that's why funguses are so good at decomposition. So the problem, however, we think is not so much that the fungus itself kills the bat, but that the bat is awakened during its winter hibernation. And it was as a result of being awakened by this fungus and trying you know, to do what it can to rid itself of it, it uses up all its stored energy and generally we think dies from starvation. So it's not a pleasant um, situation at all. We think that that fungus probably came to the US on the bottom of someone's boots who was a spelunker, somebody who explored caves and they um, were exploring caves in Europe and they came back to the US, to New York State in particular, and we were exploring in that cave. And the fungus, like in caves, doesn't matter what country it's in, um, took up residence. And since then, has been spreading across the United States, it's gone to Minnesota, and a second locus of infection started in Washington State. Somehow someone traveled to Washington State with the fungus as well and it's spreading out of Washington state as, as well. So that's one source uh, that is a threat to bats and is a very important one because we have not found a solution to stopping it. The second source, most important threat to bats is wind turbines. Um, this is a, in 600, Sorry, in 2014, we believed that 600,000 bats a year were being killed by wind turbines. We now believe that that's close to a million, probably because we're expanding the number of wind turbines. The bats that are attracted to wind turbines are not the same bats that succumb most frequently to white nose syndrome. The bats that are being killed by turbines are bats called tree bats and they are bats which migrate. So the myotis bats hibernate within generally 100 to 200 miles of the same place that they have um, their summer roost and maternity colonies. However, there are three bats in Maine, the hoary, the eastern red, and the silver-haired bat that take another response to our foodless winters in Maine. The, we have something called the MAD rule. The MAD rule is short for migrate, adapt, or die. So in Maine, if you're a insect eater, you have a choice. You can migrate, to a warmer climate where there's some insects, or you can adapt, which in the case of bats is hibernating in a hibernacula. So these three bats actually fly along the eastern seaboard down to the Gulf states, Central America, or the Caribbean. And they spend, because they can't tolerate the cold temperatures, they spend their winters in much more amenable climates. Um, we aren't sure if they hibernate while they're there or whether they are active while they're there. We think they hibernate, but again, because we don't know as much about bats as we wish we did, um, we're not absolutely sure of what they do do when they get there, only that they do get there. And we know that because we have cell towers all along the route and we are able to pick up bat calls along the way. So we know they're traveling from here along the coast to there. So third most important is pesticides. Because all the insect, all the bats in the United States eat insects. If we poison insects, and bats eat poisoned, but not yet dead insects, they will bioaccumulate. In other words, they will accumulate 
the pesticides in their tissues. If it doesn't make them, if it doesn't kill them, it will make them sick or make them vulnerable to other illnesses. So this is a graph I was telling you about um, in the past. Um, this was in two, this was 2016. And this was a survey data from hibernacular surveys. And you can see in 2009, we had, we counted in those three hibernacular that we know about 579 bats. In 2010, 790. And that's when white nose struck. 2011 had 75 bats. And the low, as you can see, is 27. This is really important information. These are the, um, I sh this is a little out of order, but these are the three um, tree bats that are killed by wind turbines. Um, and these are some things that we can do. Someone asked about that. We can, we can support LD807, which did pass, so that's all good. That means that we have three species that are on the threatened and endangered species list in Maine, one of which is also listed nationally. And the result of being on those endangered species lists is the state has to make some kind of plan for the best practices around those animals, what we can do to help keep them from slipping into extinction. Unfortunately, and I'll talk about that I think a little bit later after I go through the rest of this slide, um, there are not robust responses to saving bats in Maine. What we can do as individuals is we can build and maintain bat boxes in locations that are inaccessible to predators and ideal for bats. So I want to speak for just a moment about predators because we often don't think about bats as having predators. I once um, spent the summer living in a tent uh, in Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire, as I worked for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And we had lots of little, little brown bats and some of them like to sleep under the tent flap during the day. But one of the people who were living at um, Camp Dodge also had a cat. And that cat was responsible for a lot of bat kill that summer. Um, I guess it's hard to imagine most of the time that a bat is going to be a predator, uh, is predated by cats. But this cat was particularly good. And it could be because the bats were hanging out under our tent flaps. I'm not sure. Um, so if you've ever been to any of the large caves out west, you probably know that there are lots of hawks who wait until dusk and then gather all around the openings to those bat caves. And they prey on bats as they're leaving the bat cave in the evening or returning in the morning. Um, so large birds can prey on bats. Even blue jays can prey on bats. Other mammals that prey on, uh, in the, at night, sorry, I should stick with the birds for a minute. Owls prey on bats. Um, raccoons can climb trees and they prey on bats. They're tiny little tidbits of yummy, good things. And uh, along with that, Squirrels also eat bats, especially if they can get baby bats, which are completely defenseless. So it's really important that when you put up a bat box, you put it in a place that predators cannot access. For example, at my house, the bat box is above the second floor in the gable end of my house. There's 
it would be very, very difficult for a predator to climb the side of my house and reach into that bat box and get a bat. Or to somehow uh, jump down from the roof and onto the bat box and into the bat box to, to take any of the young that might be staying there during the, the day or the night. So um, making sure you have some way of excluding predators is really important. Another thing that's really important is bats um, need to conserve energy as much as possible. When the temperature drops below 69 degrees, they often go into torpor, which is a lowered state of metabolism, which allows them to conserve energy. Um, so unlike with birdhouses, you can paint your, bird, your bat box black to make it warmer for the bats. It should also be placed in a southern location if possible, southwestern if not possible. I mine's on the western side because the south side of the house is shaded. Um, and it should be free of any kinds of trees or other um, sheltering areas, 20 to, well, 40 feet is the choice, the best choice. If you can have 40 feet of clear space around the bat box, that's really good. Because as I mentioned, predators hang out waiting for the bats to come out. So they need to be able to dive out of their box and off in any direction in order to make sure that there's not a predator hanging on a tree overhead that's waiting for them to come out. So a clear space around the bat box, a black color on the bat box, um, a south facing bat box, all of those things at a good height, preferably two stories is good, um, are important for making sure that you're not setting the bats up for predation. For those people who don't like to have bats in their house, please um, go to the IFNW website and put in bats and it will show you how to exclude bats without killing them, without calling an exterminator and within the babies inside. Right now, all the maternal roosts have young. If you have bats in your house now and you wait till dusk and then you put up something to block them from coming back into the house, all the babies will die because their parents will not be able to access them. Okay, um, and also please reduce your use of pesticides, preferably no pesticides. I live on a blueberry farm. We have lots of pests and we've made a pledge not to spray because of the number of insects that are needed by bats. Oops, so I'm sorry. I just went to the IFNW page and it's moved from where I had it. Okay, now let me get back to my. Okay, so one of the things that I like to talk about is the myths that are associated with bats because many people live in fear of bats. Um, there are no recorded cases of bats being caught in here. Just want to say that none, zero. Look it up. There are no cases of bats being caught in here. If they are flying near your head, they are feeding on insects. And you probably attract a lot of insects, especially in the evening with mosquitoes out. So if they're coming by you, um, they're not going to run into you. They're really good at navigating and they, um, they may come very close to you. I've had bats come so close to me I could feel their wing beats. Um, I've, had, I've been in caves, spelunking, and been in this narrow tunnel that I could barely get through and bats have flown straight for me and not run into me because they're able to na navigate around the space that you um, have around your head. 
So the bats will not run into you. They will not get in your hair and get stuck. Um, secondly is bat rabies. So I have seen uh, places say that one in seven bats tested has rabies. Please remember, those are bats that are being tested because someone has thought that, you know, maybe the bat was acting strangely and they brought it in to be tested. That is not one in seven bats in the wild. In the wild, one in 20,000 bats is estimated to have rabies. And unlike canine rabies, the rabies that your dog, cat, a raccoon, a squirrel, or another um, mammal might have, bat rabies, bats with rabies do not seek out someone to bite. So they don't suddenly become vampire bats when they have rabies. And they don't seek out, um, like a human being who has rabies will seek out something to bite so they can transmit the virus. It's a mechanism the virus has when it enters our brain to get passed on to another organism and survive. They um, hardwire us or softwire us to try to bite something. That doesn't happen with bats. Nonetheless, doctors are taught by, to take every precaution necessary if, they're, um, if they think someone has been exposed to a bat that could maybe be the one in 20,000 that has rabies, they often will say, um, if the bat's flying around, you know, in your house, as you don't know how long it's been there, blah, 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 um, that maybe you should get rabies shots. It's a really, really um, slim chance that that would happen, but if um, the doctor recommends it, go ahead and do it, you know? Can't hurt, or can't hurt, but if you wanna do it and be sure, then um, go ahead. Um, but along with that, I would also caution that if you have a bat who's acting unbat-like, like hanging around during the day, um, looking like it's having a difficult time flying. Those are not opportunities where you should be picking the bat up. Um, I, if the bat is acting strange and you feel like it's in your house and you need to get rid of it, don't touch the bat. Put a box over it. Use, a, use something to scoop it into the, into the box if you have to. But that would be only if the bat is acting strangely. Um, I was teaching one day and I had a, there was a bat that had, it was a little brown bat, just happened to be somehow get into the school overnight and it was hanging out on the wall of the corridor. So before the custodian could get it with a broom, I found a box to put over it and then slide something behind the box, brought it outside and uh, released it high up because bats have really weak legs. They hang upside down all the day, all the time. They don't go hiking or anything. So their legs are really weak. And it is very difficult because of the length of their wings. If you place the bat on the ground, it's almost impossible for it to get flight. A bat's wings are, each wing is six times the, in length, the width of its body. And if you think about trying to flap your wings when there's, each one is six times the length of your body, then you know it's gonna be really hard to get off the ground. So the best, if you have to move a bat from your house, the best thing is to take it to a second story window and um, release it there so it can fly off because walking is just not its forte. Um, if the bat, if you have bats in your house and they're flying back and forth in your house, um, I know that's disturbing, but they're just looking for a way to get out. You do not need to get a net. 
You don't need to get a broom. You don't need to get a bat. I've heard all kinds of weird things that people do. You just need to open the window, preferably one without a screen on it. Open the window, open the door, the bat will go out. That's all it wants to do is go out. It doesn't like really being in your house. Okay. So I often get the question of how long will it take if there are some bats that are able to withstand white nose, some of the myotis bats that are able to be the one genetically um, genetic variation for that particular species that is able to survive white nose. How long will it be before we will see a repopulation of little brown bats in Maine? The answer is not good. It will be, if they are able to survive, it would take thousands and thousands of years for their populations to recover. So that has to do with bat biology. The first thing we should know about bats is that they're mammals. They're not birds, they're not insects, they're mammals. And that has a lot of limitations to it. Bats are the only flying mammals. Because they're mammals, they are warm-blooded, which means that they have to eat a lot in order to keep their temperature up and survive. That means they give live birth. And it also, so they have a fully formed young, it's not an egg that they can just watch over for a while. It's a fully formed baby that is produced. And it also means that they have to feed their young with milk from mammary, mammary glands. As a result of that, most bats can only spare the energy to produce one young per year. That means that it's very difficult to reproduce the population because even if you have one young, the chances of its survival are limited. Secondly, their food is insects. We're in the middle of a main summer, so it seems like insects are everywhere. But by the time the end of September, October comes around, there's not many insects out there. That means that in order to gain weight, a bat has from end of April, say, to September to eat and store energy. However, they fly. And the way they get their food is by flying. Have you ever seen a fat bat? No, because if you're fat, you can't fly. So there's only a certain amount of weight that a bat can put on. Not like a bear who's hibernating or a red squirrel who's hibernating. They can put on as much fat as well not as much fat as they want to probably, but they can put on a sizable amount of fat to help them through the winter. But a bat cannot because they can't fly. And if you can't fly because you're fat, you can't eat. So that's an automatic dieting restriction. And as I mentioned, they, can they generally only give birth to one. There are a few species, the tree bats in particular, that are able to give birth to two and sometimes three, but generally it's one baby per year. Some of the other limitations are that if, if you are a female, or if you are a bat, period, and you're hibernating, you will lose one quarter to one third of your body weight over the course of your hibernation. Now, if 
you're thinking about yourself and you lose a quarter or a third of your weight, there would be some deep concern about your survival. That is why it is extremely important in the spring that bats find food as fast as possible. Because when they awake, if they awake at all, when they awake, they must find food immediately. I, um, I had a situation at a church in Farmington where they were doing renovations and they had some overwintering bats and they wanted to um, protect them and save them, which is great. I'm always glad to hear that. And um, I brought them to a bat rehabilitator and the bat rehabilitator said there were some bats in that group that would not have made it through the winter because they'd already lost too much body weight. So that's always a concern for bats and a late winter is difficult for bats or late spring rather, early winter. Um, the other thing that is true is that female bats can lose a quarter to a third of their weight giving birth. So you've already gone through the winter, you've lost a quarter to a third of your weight, now it's April, you've got from April to June to get your body weight up as high as you can get it before you give birth. Bats have delayed implantation, they actually mate in the fall and then they don't implant the embryo until the springtime, which is great because that would be the end because they would not be able to maintain a pregnancy over the winter. So in the springtime, they're eating, 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 eating until June when they give birth and then they lose weight again. Now they have from June, I'm sorry. Yes, from June to September, to put on enough weight to make it through hibernation. Bats live on the edge at all times, at all times. So you've been sticking with me through all this. We're almost at the end. Thank you um, for your patience. This is a bat skeleton. I'm gonna give you just a moment to look at it and think about it. So hopefully you all noticed how remarkably similar a bat skeleton is to a human skeleton. Same finger bones, same toe bones, same leg bones, ribs, pelvis. They, they have a tail, we don't have a tail. Um, and their fingers, and their as you can see, those long bones that you're seeing there are actually their fingers. So if you outstretched your arms as far as you could and raise them up a little bit and could lengthen your fingers so that they reach the floor, your skeleton and your forearms were a little bit longer, I would say, your skeleton would look very much like a bat skeleton. This is called a clada or a clade. Um, and this is drafted for main mammals. And the, the reason why we do this is to show how animals are related to each other. So the closer together um, the two lines are, the more closely related an organism is. So you can look through and see, you know, carniv carnivores, rodents, um, etc. And many people have told me when I asked them what's the closest relationship to closest mammal related to a bat, they've said, well, a mouse, you know, a mouse. So look where bats are and look where rodents are. Not closely related at all. However, if you look to see what is the most closely related organism to a bat, in Maine, you will see that we are connected directly 
as the most closely related organism to a bat. In Maine, where there are no other primates, our closest relative is bats. So I hope this presentation gives you an appreciation for bats. That's my goal, that from listening to this presentation, you will care about bats in a way that you never expected you would. And I take this quote from Le Petit Prince um, in his conversation with the fox, and it's the fox that's actually speaking to him. And I've changed a few words here. What does tamed mean? It means to create ties. I have no need for you. You have no need for me either. But if you name me, we'll need each other. You will be the only boy for me. I'll be the only fox in the world for you. If you name me, my life will fill with sunshine. I'll know the sound of footsteps. Your footsteps will be different from all the rest. Here is my secret. It's quite simple. One sees clearly only with the heart. And that is what I'm asking you to do. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. That was fantastic. Thank you. And, and how do I stop the share? It looks, and you actually answered all the questions that I had on my list. Um, <laughs> but I did see some come in through the chat. I would be glad to, to uh, answer any questions. Um, can you? There are, oh, here it is. There are, oh, here are a couple of questions um, that we had. So one person asked, um, do different bat species ever interact with one another, whether competitively for food or shelter or even collaboratively? So thank you very much. That was a good question. I love that question. Um, so we don't know of any direct interactions, but, but there are several species of bats that do share uh, hibernacular together. So like um, the niches that they have for feeding, like each bat has particular species that it prefers. Brown bats tend to like beetles. Um, the silver-haired bat tends to like moths. Um, some bats, like little brown bats, tend to like flies. So they have evolved into separate feeding niches and also, in many cases, separate roosting areas where they will uh, spend their um, maternity colony time. However, they do have the hibernacula that they use in common, and some bats do harass other bats. So the largest bat in Maine is the hoary bat, and that bat does harass um, the eastern red, it has been seen to harass eastern red. Now, I don't know if it does that commonly or if that was an um, unusual situation, but it does um, interact in a negative way with that bat. Do you have other questions, Ruth? We had a one question was, um, I know bats hibernate in caves. What other locations can you find her, her hibernacula? So again, this is one of those big mystery questions. Old abandoned mines are definitely a site. Caves, we think um, not necessarily large caves like you see out west. Caves here in the eastern United States tend to be very small and more like cracks in the um, rock than they are real caves. Um, we know that big brown bats sometimes overwinter in homes. And I did have someone tell me once that they uh, were doing an attic renovation in their house and unwittingly disturbed some brown bats, big brown bats, not little brown bats, 
big brown bats who had been overwintering um, and which escaped the house, but they uh, found them dead in the snow. So that much we know. Uh, and of course, there are the tree bats that do not hibernate here in the north. If they hibernate, they hibernate in their southern um, hibernation homes. I have one that just came in uh, through private chat. Can bats be GPS tagged to help locate them? I would think that they could because, um, you know, they, they do GPS tag other animals. I don't know of any studies where that's actually occurred. Um, although I do know studies that have noted that they know where a bat um, has its maternity colony and they know where it was found in a hibernaculum. So there must be some way of tracing them. And I don't know if it's by banding or if it was by GPS. But the thing to remember about bats the, all the myotis bats weigh about the same as a nickel. So they average between four and six ounces, and that's not a lot of weight. So you can't add too much to that and still expect them to survive um, the, their flight and their winter um, hibernation. Um, somebody asked uh, if you have any suggestions for resources for building bat houses? Oh, there are, there are so many sites online. You can just look it up, Google it, bat houses. Um, to give a little caution, especially here in the Northeast, you want to make sure that all the seams are completely sealed. You want to, um, I've seen plans that had a bottom on the box and I've ha seen other sites that said you shouldn't put a bottom on the box, even if it's open partly, because you have to, that's how the bats get in, they fly up through the bottom, because they're afraid that accumulating um, bat feces will actually cause um, fungus to grow. And that would be bad for the bats. So I would look at several sites before I decided on one. The, um, the main state prison at the prison store in Thomaston also has bat boxes for sale. Um, they do put a bottom on theirs, but it's pretty easy to take it off if you'd like. So that's an easy way to get a pretty inexpensive bat box. I know that the estuary got a uh, deluxe bat box that was um, on sale for $250. Uh, I think the ones at the Maine State Prison, which are not deluxe and not made of cedar, um, they're made of pine, go for about $20. And all told, I think your labor and lumber costs, that's a pretty good deal. Somebody asked um, what they could do to start studies or accounts in their own area. So Maine, that's a good question, Maine IFNW, um, had a bat me survey project, which I don't think they're doing anymore. Um, although I have asked the person who's the small mammal biologist who's in charge of that, I, I didn't get a response. Um, she had initially said, she, well, I'll get back to you, but I haven't heard. So I'm, I'm not sure how they're handling that now. I initially signed up for a bat survey, which was a 50 mile round trip stretch. I have a special microphone that picks up bat calls and I drive at 20 miles per hour from here to Rumford and back with the little microphone outside and I have a software program that tells me what bats are calling so we can actually count and because we're going 20 miles per hour we're pretty sure there's no bats flying at 20 miles per hour so each count each back call is an individual bat. Um, Maine Audubon, last I knew, had a microphone that could be borrowed and the software could be downloaded and you could, uh, they actually might have provided a 
written uh, notebook or something to go with that. So if you wanted to try it out, you could get, you could borrow that from Maine Audubon. I think they were doing one week opportunities and you could survey your own home to see what kinds of bats are around. Um, I also take my microphone to individual homes. Uh, if people around here want to know what's, you know, what's happening at their house and we can count bats that way. And I check out the bats in my own field. You can purchase that yourself. Um, it's a couple hundred dollars, um, but it has a software program that goes with just about any computer if you're interested. I would contact Maine IFNW and ask for the small mammal biologist that's in charge of bats if you want to um, see if they're still collecting data. Someone asked, um, how do they know what type of bat they have in their yard? Is there a way to tell? There's no easy way to tell. Um, even with the myotis bats, there's, they look so much alike unless you can get your hands on them and look at them up close that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, I have brown bats at my, big brown bats, not little brown bats, big brown bats at my house, um, which I knew before I even got my microphone because I was painting my house and they were under my shutters. And when I removed the shutter, they didn't move. So I just took pictures of them while they're there and then I could I identify them. But the best way to identify the bats that you have is by recording them with a microphone that can actually pick up bat sounds and um, a software program that allows you to identify it. That's the best way to do it because generally they're coming out when it's either dusk or dark. You can't really see them. And unless you can see them in daylight and you can get fairly close to them, you will not be able to identify what bat you have. Um, I think we might have time for another one or two questions. Um, one question was, um, someone has bats and flying squirrels living in the same space. Are they a problem for each other? Like will the squirrels potentially harm the bats? Well, I don't know about flying squirrels, I'll be honest. Um, flying squirrels' primary food source is acorns. Um, I know that red squirrels will eat bats and gray squirrels are, will eat bats, but I do not know about flying squirrels. Um, maybe you can tell me what the outcome is. <laughs> that would be good, good to know. We had a question, um, one from like a land trust perspective, but also just an individual asking, you know, they know they have bats in their property. What can they do to help keep them happy? They don't use pesticides. Is there anything else they can do? So when they say, um, I might need some clarification. When they say they know they have bats on their property, um, this person has bats uh, living in their barn. In their barn. Okay, great. Um, so I'm assuming that the bats have decided that that's a good place for them to stay. So do as little to disturb them as possible. That would be my um, recommendation. Bats are really hard um, in terms of, I, I think I mentioned before that we're supposed to have a plan for what we're going to do to make sure that the bats do not become extinct. But undisturbed habitat is probably the best thing you can do for a bat. But different bats like different types of habitats. Like the big brown bat really likes agricultural land. And so open fields are really good, even though that's not a natural environment for the state of Maine. It's a, it's a good habitat for brown bats. And each of the bats has different habitat needs. So um, managing for a particular bat species, you might be able to say, okay, we, we really wanna do something for the long-eared bats. We're gonna make sure this old growth forest isn't disturbed or um, that we don't take down snags 
So those are trees that have died but haven't fallen yet. Those are good habitat for those types of bats. But to actually um, not know the species of the bat and try to manage habitat for it is very difficult. So I would do as little as possible to disturb the bat. Don't use pesticides and um, just try to keep them happy by not disturbing them. I think we might be out of time for questions. I know there were a couple more and I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, um, but we don't wanna to run too much past the hour. Um, ben, could you wrap up please? Yeah. Yes, and I will take note of all the questions, any of the questions that came in that we didn't get to, um, and I'll forward them along to Jan. And we also have some resources that I'm happy to uh, send along to everybody that joined us today as well. But thank you, Jan, so much. That was a really great presentation. And uh, thank you, everybody else that was able to join us as well um, and for giving us some time this Thursday evening. It's really been great. Thank you, everybody. All right, and that concludes our evening. Uh, so thank you all again. Have a great night.